Thank you, Dana. Well, it's a, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, and this is also a pleasure to be part of Lights Out Heartland. Um, we have, a, I think, a really interesting program tonight. Uh, we have two speakers by you. Uh, Gopi is a professor, astronomer of physics at uh, Truman State Uni Kirk University in Kirksville. Uh, by the way, he's a, the person who manages our statewide uh, sky brightness measurement program. We have something like 17 measurement sites throughout the state. And then we have Dr. Brex Brett Seymour. He's a uh, behavioral ecologist. He's with Washington University. He's a fun guy to talk to. Um, I've learned a lot about bugs and spiders and insects, whatever else. It's always great to have. And I'll be the host tonight as far as just emceeing. Uh, we will be taking questions at the end. So the idea is that each of these presenters will talk roughly 20 minutes and then we'll try to leave 10 or 15 minutes at the end based on how all this works out. So if you could put your questions in the uh, boxes uh, Dana suggested, uh, that'll be a, a really great choice. We'll try to uh, field all those at the end. So I'm sure what we're hoping to do tonight is really whet your appetite about lights, about Allen, which is the artificial light at night, uh, about what it, how it works and why it's a big issue. We do have some, uh, some links that will help you. I've got a, I'm gonna drop this link. It's lightsoutheartland.org slash MRBO. And you can uh, put that in your web browser later and it'll bring up all these links on the left hand, left hand side. But the website links that I have are Lights Out Heartland, which is the collaborations website that brings all these different groups. We have multiple states, multiple organizations together working uh, really to protect birds during migration from light pollution. And then we have our local chapter, darkskymissouri.org. Uh, and then we have our international uh, organization, darksky.org. Those are all really great uh, resource sites. For those of you that are interested in learning more, both these, uh, these folks that will be talking tonight will be delivering what's called uh, Dark Sky Training. That'll be March 16th and March 30th. And what we do is we take um, volunteers through about four hours of training. We go in depth between the science of light pollution, the International Dark Sky Places Program, uh, nature, with the idea that uh, you can talk with your local communities and work with them and explain to them how things work, maybe help them with programs. So it's a really great chance, I think, to really do a deep dive. It is free, and so it's all done by Zoom, and it's the evenings of March 16th and March 30th. And lastly, um, following up on what Dana talked about, we had a conference in 2021 that really turned out to be a really a lot of fun, and it was a really a good chance for conservation groups to get together. We're having another one in 2022. Uh, it'll be this one's in Kansas City, uh, Friday, September 30th. It'll be an evening, kind of like a happy hour, then all day uh, set of events, and we have a, a keynote speaker. Uh, Paul Bolgard come in, uh, come in. He's a really well-known speaker about light pollution, and he'll be traveling in to give us a keynote that night. Uh, we don't have registration open quite yet, but if you go to our website link that I have there, you can see uh, what we have so far, and, uh, and you can also sign up on our email list to be notified when registration opens. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Bayou, and he'll do his magic. He always does a great job. I'm looking forward to both speakers tonight. They, uh, I've heard these guys many times, but they're always kind of with new stuff. It's just so much fun. So I'm going to stop sharing, and Bayou, take over. All right. Thanks, Don and Dana. And I hope I'm sharing the correct screen. Can you see my presentation? Yeah, we you're, can. Uh, you're, you're showing the one with the- Perfect. Your, 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 that's it, there you go. Okay. So um, thanks again, uh, uh, Don and Dana, and thanks for everyone who has joined us. And as Don mentioned, uh, um, a little shameless plug here regarding this uh, dark sky training that's coming up. And so today's, um, presentation by Brett and I will largely be a, an appetizer, if you will, and the main course is awaiting you in March if uh, the appetizer uh, gets you going. Um, the outline of our presentation really is I'll cover certain aspects and then uh, Brett will cover some other aspects. Um, I will concentrate on defining the problem of light pollution um, intuitively, we kind of know what it is, but there are some, some technical things to keep in mind because really the exercise is not so much to, uh, is not so much just of academic interest, uh, but uh, of what to do about light pollution. So what are the solutions to it? And the way I look at it is to define the problem, uh, seek out the solutions and seek out a path to get to the solutions. And that's where some of the resources that Don mentioned earlier uh, come into play, especially from the International Dark Sky Association and the Missouri chapter of the Dark Sky Association. 
So I'll essentially define the problem, provide you with solutions, give you a hint at least of the path to take uh, to go from defining the problem to implementing the solutions. And Brett will largely motivate why should we bother with all of this by talking about uh, why fighting light pollution it should be a concern for everyone, not just say astronomers or, or, or naturalists or whatever. So what is light pollution? And generally what we think about when, we, when someone mentions light pollution is largely our inability to see the skies because there's too much ambient light. And light pollution is that, but there are different kinds of light pollution. And again, if you're thinking in terms of solution, you wanna define the problem the best you can and break it down into uh, categories so you can then address those. Um, and so uh, the way to think about it then is if you can see the light bulb of, an, of a light fixture, more often than not, it's gonna glare into your eye because it's the brightest part of the, you know, of the light uh, comes from the light bulb, obviously, then it reflects off the picture and whatnot. So if you can see the light bulb, then it's glaring and that's not ideal. Sometimes you can't avoid it, but it's not ideal. Light that goes into say your neighbor's windows or light from your neighbor's porch coming into your windows at night, that's light trespass. It's light where light's not supposed to go. And then the light that goes up into the sky, the one that we usually associate with uh, in terms of light pollution is is essentially sky glow and can go directly up into the sky or can reflect from the ground and go up into the sky. You especially notice that when the snow, uh, when the ground's covered with snow, uh, that light reflects up. Uh, so light pollution comes in these kind of different categories, but really the strictest definition of light pollution is any artificial light that is introduced into the natural environment uh, is light pollution. Of course, for practical reasons, we need light. So we can't quite uh, take that strict definition too seriously. And so a more workable, a more practical definition would be any light that is useless that we introduce, any light that doesn't serve any purpose um, is then light that we should try and eliminate the best we can. So we can, the working definition is direct the light only in the where it's needed and all other light that is going to places where it doesn't need to go, we will categorize that as light pollution. So there's directionality to light pollution, meaning there's directionality, which direction is the light going? Is it going towards the ground, sky, neighbors, window, what have you? There's intensity, how bright is your light? Is it uh, too bright for the purpose that you're using it for or is it too dim? And then uh, an aspect that is not always appreciated is the color of the light. And generally speaking, amber colored, red colored light is good. Uh, blue, white color light, which is very common. Uh, most street lights in, in Missouri are these kind of blue, white LEDs now. Uh, they are bad, they are, they're not bad, they're actually ugly <laughs> in this definition here. Uh, they're absolutely terrible. They're the worst kind of lights you can have if if you're only thinking in terms of light pollution. And then the kind of yellow creamish lights are, are okay. You can live with them, uh, but yeah, you, you, you can do better. And so that's why I've kind of labeled them as the good, the bad, and the ugly. Um, and so something to keep in mind when you go to the store and you're especially looking for outdoor lights, but I would recommend doing this for indoor lights as well is look for how bright the light is, what purpose does the light serve? Is it a table lamp? Is it a night lamp, what have you? Uh, and then this uh, color temperature, uh, and you wanna minimize this and aim to get as close to 2000 as possible, but almost always, unless you know why you're doing it, you should always try and stay below 3000 Kelvin. So this kind of information you can find there. Strictly speaking, you're not just looking for the color temperature, you're looking for something called a spectrum and you wanna minimize this blue part of the spectrum, blue light, and, and Brett might uh, talk more about this later. Uh, the blue light is the most harmful to humans and to our environment. So you wanna minimize the blue light. And so the minimal blue light is, is the best you can get. Uh, and I strongly recommend to kind of keep an eye out for that when you go buy your next light bulb. So here's the challenge we have, here's the problem. Uh, urban sprawl, increase in population, uh, as you know, as cities, towns have moved westward, you can see how light pollution has spread across the United States. 
here's our state of Missouri. You can kind of see the interstates there, 44, 70, uh, US uh, 63. Uh, and you can see cities and towns uh, growing over there and then light pollution accordingly increasing. If you zoom in for the sake of argument into the Arrow Rock area, which is at the center of this plot here, uh, you can see that there are a couple of towns nearby, some relatively big. Marshall has a population of about 12,000, and then Booneville is about 8,500. Uh, and this is significant. I'll, I'll tell you why I'm uh, uh, stressing this population aspect of it. Obviously, the greater the population, the, the worse the light pollution one can expect. Uh, but this fact that Marshall is about 10,000 uh, might be um, a significant thing for, uh, for our purposes. Uh, this, uh, these maps come from this webpage, lightpollution.info, so you, you can, it's free, you can go there and, and search for Columbia, Missouri, or something like that, uh, and then uh, if you click on any random location on the earth, it spits out a bunch of numbers, and one thing that you might readily recognize is the bottle scale, and your bottle, uh, Arrow Rock is bottle scale three, which is okay, uh, bottle scale one is the best, and then it gets successively worse uh, in terms of light pollution as you go up the ladder. Uh, so you can, you can play this game yourself. So one thing I always emphasize being trained as an astronomer myself is the inability to see stars is a symptom of the problem of light pollution. And here's a classic example. I, I took a couple of images, one in Flagstaff, Arizona, or just south of Flagstaff, Arizona on Anderson Mesa. Um, and this is the Milky Way rising. You can kind of see the tree line. The Milky Way is kind of horizontal. So it's kind of rising along the eastern, southeastern sky. This is a five minute exposure. It's beautiful. Um, you know, you can pick up some colors here and you can see in the dust lanes in our galaxy and this, that, and the other. And this is a picture I took from the observatory here in Kirksville. This is only a one minute exposure. And you see this kind of, it's, the rest of the settings are, are the same. You see this kind of wash of light uh, washing across the image, and that's just ambient light coming from the town. Um, and so this is this is a symptom of light pollution, the inability to see stars. Um, and so the way I approach the problem then is define the problem, which we kind of did, what is light pollution, and then address the problem, what are the solutions to it, and to, the way to get from the problem to the solution then is to motivate, to impress on people, both what's called the general public and then the powers that be, that this is an important environmental and health and safety issue. It's not just these crazy astronomers wanting to stay up at night and look at the sky. It is that, but that is just a symptom. The actual problem goes much deeper. And my approach is to kind of rely on this International Dark Sky Places program uh, about which we'll talk in much greater detail in our, in our workshop that we mentioned earlier coming up in March, but it kind of gives you a motivation. It kind of gives you, it kind of shows you the path to go from where you are right now in terms of outdoor lighting uh, to implementing the best practices for outdoor lighting. So again, to kind of uh, kind of tie all this together, we want to quantify the problem. So as Don mentioned earlier, we have a program in IDM Missouri where we have these sensors that actually measure the amount of light pollution um, and then see what can be done about it in, in scientific terms, if you will, in terms of technical uh, fixes. Um, and then there's education and outreach. You want to try and uh, you know, inform people about the problem and, and the potential solutions. And then we want to actually, um, you know, do some level of activism, some level of actual change on the ground. And usually the concern with that all said and done comes down to finding money to do it. So what are the technical solutions? Um, one thing to keep in mind, like I said, there are these different types of light pollution. And then uh, part of the reason uh, we have light pollution is well, not part, the reason we have light pollution is we have outdoor lights. And then you ask, okay, why do we have outdoor lights? And so it's always uh, at the back of our mind, we should have, there is a purpose for outdoor lighting. And what we are asking for is really, we want dark skies. No one's saying we should have a dark ground. We should have as much illumination as we need on the ground for the purpose of safety, for the purpose of um, aesthetic value, for the purpose of uh, encouraging economic development. And all of that then comes into play in these kind of different um, you know, avenues. Like, is it a downtown area? Is it in the middle of the forest somewhere? Is it 
a park? Is it a sporting uh, arena, et cetera? Or is it a housing complex, et cetera, et cetera? So there is a purpose to outdoor lighting, but um, we want to make sure that that lighting is done in a way that it doesn't affect the environment as, as much. It doesn't ruin the night sky and the nighttime environment as much. And so what are these technical solutions? They're actually as simple as they can get. One is use these kind of amber red colored outdoor lights. That's not hard to do. These lights are available now, LED lights, they save you money. Um, and um, they are least harmful to the environment, to plants, animals, birds, insects, etc. cetera. Uh, and your light bulb is gonna go off at some point. You're gonna buy a new light bulb at some point. Well, just get an amber colored light bulb instead of a blue white one. The second one is so obvious that it, I like to emphasize it is that turn off the lights when you don't need them. Uh, I mean, I always tell my students because they, you know, last student leaves the room, the classroom and they don't turn off the lights. And I said, you know, that's not how I was raised. <laughs> my parents would yell at me if I don't turn off the lights, if I was the last person to leave the room and that stuck with me. I mean, why, why do you leave the lights? On? Unless you know you're gonna go back soon, why, why leave the lights on? whether you are indoors or outdoors, it serves no purpose whatsoever. Unless, unless there is a purpose. And in that case still, if there is a purpose to your outdoor light, then make sure it's well shielded. So it's dark sky friendly. And if possible, invest some money. It still requires some investment, but if possible, then, in, then uh, employ a timer uh, or a motion sensor so that it turns on when it's needed and then it turns off when nobody's around. Because again, why is this light on when nobody needs it? So the technical solutions are straightforward. Use amber colored lights, shield them, turn them off when you don't need them. The challenge of course is to bring about change is not just the technical part of it, is you wanna change people's habits. Uh, and people's habits are things that people do without necessarily consciously thinking about it. And that's why it makes it actually harder to fix it because you're telling people to change their habits. And so there's institutional inertia. This is how it's been done forever. So we'll keep doing it the same way. There's always that. And so what the approach, again, you can take to this is depending on your expertise, depending on how strongly you feel about this, uh, you can either take a bottom up approach, meaning you talk to your neighbor, you talk to your friends, if you are at a stargazing event or a naturalist event, or you're doing a nature walk, you know, bring it up that, oh, you know, you have all these insects and bugs and pollinators, and then you have these bright lights over here. How does that, how does that gel together? Because it's inconsistent. You have this beautiful garden that you're setting up for the pollinators, but then you have terrible lighting. What's that all about? Uh, and then, of course, you can talk, the, talk to the administrators by, you know, the powers that be who, you know, there are, uh, like I tell my students, there are, there are probably 10 people in a small town like Kirksville that if you convince them to do something, the chances of something getting done just go up exponentially. Even if you talk to 10,000 other people, uh, you know, the chances of them actually doing something are minimal because there are other things to worry about. There's, you know, life gets in the way, et cetera, et cetera. But there are these 10 people who actually make the decisions. And if you can get to them somehow, at least some of them, get them on your side, your chances improve. So both approaches have their own merits and, and, and we like to take both those approaches. And I recommend that you think about it as well if you, if you feel strongly about the issue. And so like I mentioned, we want to change behavior. And one thing you can readily do, uh, you're an audience that is here because you're interested in nature, you care about nature. It's part of your DNA, so to speak, because uh, otherwise, you know, why are you here? You're here because you, you love nature in, in, in all its aspects. And the night sky or, or, or a nighttime environment is usually ignored. You know, we, we go out during the day, we look at all these beautiful things during the day, the, 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 the flowers and the birds, the bees, all that sort of thing. And then we kind of almost tune out because we go indoors, turn, out, you know, turn on our lights and watch TV or whatever. We kind of almost block out what's going on, on outside. It's the same flowers out there, it's the same bees out there who are suffering because of our bad habits. And so, See if you can start a dark sky group within your group or at least include dark sky related language and concepts and ideas that, hey, hey, they're, they're putting new lights in this park because you know, they want people uh, to use it in the evening and walk around in, in a jogging park or a biking pa path or something like that. Well, you know, who, who's lighting it? Who's, who, who, have you thought about these aspects? You can always bring those things up. And so 
the way in which you can learn about our, the way in which I learned about some of these kind of best practices was to firstly use the resources on the International Dark Sky Association's page. And the mission of this International Dark Sky Association is to preserve and protect the nighttime environment. And they provide you with lots of resources, both in terms of basic definitions, just basic know-how, and also ideas and tips and a framework and a um, community that has gone through some of this before and so have the experience to, to help you uh, do it. And, and I, I have benefited greatly from, from people in the IDA, either in their official capacity or just as someone who has gone through this before to guide me along. Uh, and I'm sure Don and uh, Brett will second that. And then our mission here at Dark Sky Missouri is kind of to build on that and to do it specifically in the context of Missouri and see if we can protect and even reclaim some of our beautiful night skies and help uh, communities save energy and, and reduce their carbon footprint. And the International Dark Sky Places Program is one where it kind of gives you this path. And again, we don't have the time here to kind of go through all of this in all its glorious detail, uh, but a general outline of it is, it, or the general kind of philosophy there, uh, as, as I see it anyway, is whatever this Dark Sky Places program is, you have a few steps to meet, what kind of lighting you have, how are you gonna fix it, what are you gonna do, which lights are fixed, uh, which lights are shielded, which lights you need to keep on, but you have a timer on it. it there, is a, there is a pathway to it and there, are, uh, there is a procedure to it. But the process, forget the actual certification at the end, but the process of going through it, if you just follow those steps, then you're automatically improving your outdoor lighting. You're forming um, communities, you're forming networks, you're talking to people who otherwise wouldn't have thought about these sorts of things. And because the technical solutions are so straightforward, it literally sometimes is a question of just bringing it up because people haven't thought of it. It's not as if people are sitting there in you know dark uh, you know uh, rooms smoking cigars, wondering how can I now ruin the night sky. No, nobody does that. But the you know the problem is even worse. They don't even think about it. They just say, oh, let's light up this place because of you know because we have the money. It doesn't cost as much anymore because of LEDs. Let's do it. So you just need to get into that ear and their ear and say, hey, think about it. Really. So the most relevant of all these dark sky places programs is what's called the urban night sky places. Again, the details of this we will talk about in our, um, uh, in our workshop uh, in March. But ag again, feel free to ask me questions. I'll be happy to respond to any questions you might have regarding this. And Arrow Rock is, 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 is perfect as a starting point for, for you because it is indeed within 32 miles of a municipality which has at least 10,000 people. And that is uh, Marshall. Uh, 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 Boonesville actually has less than 10,000, but Marshall does have more than 10,000. So you're good in that regard. And as long as you have nighttime access to at least, um, you know, for campers and, and anyone who wants to stargaze, I don't know if that's the case with Arrow Rock, but my guess is it's a state park and has camping. So obviously has nighttime access. Um, and so again, the process of getting there is to me more important because that will uh, lead you to, you know, doing some of these things that uh, you want to do in your community. If, if you care about birds, if you care about bees, if you care about nature, you should care about it, not just during daytime when you see everything, but also what's going on at night. And this Urban Night Sky Places provides you with that pathway to do so. All right, so I'm kind of running out of time. So I think Brett will take over from here. I just want to mention one thing, one thing uh, very clearly, and I'll just give you one example is that the general notion that more lighting makes you safer is a mistaken notion. Uh, here's a classic example of this, an excellent example of this. Here's a student standing right under this very bright light. Uh, and you can see the student, great. You can see the you know, crosswalk, you can see all that. And the student just moves a couple of steps away from where they were standing and you can't see them anymore. And we've all, I have all, I have witnessed this myself when I'm walking in a very glary or very bright area and I'm startled when someone suddenly appears in front of me because I couldn't see them because, and as, as I like to put it, the brightest light casts the darkest shadow. And so it, bright lights will contract your eyeballs. And so your ability to see things in, in darker areas decrease. The student actually just standing right here, literally took a couple of steps away and Bright light doesn't necessarily make you safe. You uh, encounter this, here's another example, 
you encounter this all the time when you are driving, especially on one-way streets and you have those lights coming in from the other side. There is more light. Do you feel safe? Can you see clearly what's in front of you if there's a deer or something in front of you? Of course not. So the human safety aspect is something that I always like to point out because it's one of the things people bring up is, oh, you want to turn off all the lights, which no one's saying, first of all. But even if that were the case, just having more light is not always the best solution. Having smarter, well-directed lights is what we want. And that's what we are advocating. Okay, with that, I will, I will hand it over to Brett, who can then tell you why should we care so much about light pollution and how it affects humans and, and animals, plants, birds, and so on and so forth. Brett? Excellent. Thank you, Vayu. Uh, thank you, Dana and Don. This is it's always a fun uh, time to talk about the, the things that get uh, Vayu and I going. And of course, that's light pollution. Um, so I think it is really important to note that this is just a crash course, right? Uh, both Vayu and I are going pretty quick. There's a lot more uh, detail. And even, I mean, you get us at the bar, there's a lot more nuances. But right now, I just want to give you a very quick overview of the importance of light and life and how light pollution then disrupts that importance of light. Uh, and do come to our training sessions and I can give you more, more detail. I'm also going to tell you that I'm not, I, I'm a biologist, so I usually approach uh, well anything in the sense of biology and not just specific to some organism. So I'm not going to just talk about birds or just talk about insects. I'm going to talk about the holistic view of biology, and then you can kind of apply that to whatever your favorite organisms are, because they're all evolved, right? So they all kind of have the same mechanistic effects. Um, all right, so let's get started. So with that in mind, um, right, we can break down biology into different levels of organization, uh, ranging from atoms up to the organism, and then to populations and communities, ecosystems, biomes of them, the entire planet or the biosphere. And that's what I want to do really quickly here is break down the effects of light and light pollution at these different levels. So we'll start at the smallest ones that are responsible for any kind of life, which are molecules, and how those then cascade up to have serious implications uh, on biological systems with regards to light pollution. So starting with uh, molecules. There are these really amazing molecules uh, that everyone, mostly, well, everyone takes for granted. And these are opsins. Uh, and these are the whole reason that you can see, right? Or even if, let's say that you're blind, you still have opsins that do other stuff because they detect light and you have circadian rhythms. So opsins are incredibly important. Uh, this is what allows us to see the million different colors that we can see. This is what allows birds to see the hundred different million colors that they can see. Um, and what they are, these tiny, tiny little molecules that are, they're on a cell membrane and they actually detect a photon. So, you know, think of a, a small piece of light, a photon comes and it hits this molecule. The molecule absorbs it and actually changes shape. And then that uh, shape change in that molecule leads to this huge cascade of events that can actually lead to the perception of light, or at least the detection of light. And so these are the, the fundamental unit at which light pollution affects pretty much all organisms. Most, most organisms will have some sort of opsin or photoreceptor that detects light. So plants, mushrooms, of course, animals, uh, but even you know cyanobacteria and other um, bacteria and uh, archaea have been shown to have photoreceptors that are detecting light. And so we go up from the, the, uh, the molecules, the opsins, and we have cells. And so now you actually have a full photoreceptor that encases all of these, these opsin molecules. And these are really the unit that can capture light, filter it, and then send a signal to another cell that then can make a decision about it. And so the photoreceptors that you're probably most aware of are your rods and cones, uh, which are in your retina. And so these rods and cone cells um, are the reason we can see. Cone cells give us our color vision. So most 
Uh, humans will have three different cones, although there are some females that actually have four different cones, and there are some colorblind people that might have fewer than three cones. It's also important to note that, because I'm colorblind, but I have three cones, so we're just gonna, we're gonna get rid of this misconception right now. But first, just look at these cones, right? So you have a blue cone, you have a green cone, and you have a red cone. Notice that the red cone is actually, the peak of this red cone is right around yellow. It's not actually red. And it has to do with the fact that we call it the red because it does have this long tail that does absorb into the red wavelengths of light. Now, red-green colorblindness, which is quite common in uh, Caucasian males, about 10% of Caucasian males have this. Again, I have this. Uh, it's not that we're missing one of these cones, but instead one of these cones is actually shifted closer to the other cone. So it just reduces the ability to actually distinguish between red and green. Um, and I, I bring this up because this is what's happening. This is what's happened across the animal kingdom, where you have these duplications of these photoreceptors uh, that allows for different color vision. And sometimes they get closer, sometimes they get further apart. Uh, and Thus, most organisms see the world much differently than us, and that's also the case uh, for light pollution. So a lot of organisms, I have a paper on this, uh, which I'm happy to share, but we showed that pretty much all organisms see light pollution in a different way than what we do. So you can't just think like, oh, because you know this light looks this color to me, it's what other animals are going to see. It's actually very, very different. That's beyond the scope of this talk. I can talk more about that during the training, but really that should be an entire course by itself. Anyway, the point is you've got these cells uh, that are the photoreceptors that house billions of opsins within them, and they're what's basically catching the light and then sending a signal to a nerve cell, which then will send a signal to the brain. Now we're talking about these rods and cones, which are visual photoreceptors, but there's also these non-visual photoreceptors, and these are super important. Um, I don't know how, I don't want to be alarmist and I don't want to sound hyperbolic, but this is why light pollution is a serious problem. Even if you, you know, you're super rich, so you can just spend all the money on lighting. You, you know, you hate astronomers. You don't want to see the sky. Uh, all the, the things that we talk about, right? You, you want to just blast light all night long. This is the problem. This is the real problem that you'd have to worry about. And that is these non-visual photoreceptors. So these, again, have opsins, but they're not actually part of the visual pathway. And one of the opsins is called melanopsin. Melanopsin is directly related to the secretion of melatonin. I should say, well, it's directly related, but inversely. So melanopsin detects blue light. In, in mammals, we have melanopsin in our retina, but it's not part of the, the visual system. And you can see that here. They're, these are called intrinsically photos, photoreceptive retinal ganglia cells. It's a mouthful. Uh, but just know that so melatonin or melanopsin is in there. And the way this works is blue light hits melanopsin. Melanopsin then sends a signal to the brain saying, do not create melatonin. When blue light goes away, like it would when day's not there, right? You don't have all the blue light coming from the, the sky. Uh, Melanopsin is no longer catching blue photoreceptors, or sorry, it's no longer catching blue photons. So then the photoreceptor doesn't send a, an off signal to the brain. The brain then starts secreting melatonin. We know that melatonin, most people probably know about melatonin being a really important hormone for sleep and circadian rhythms. And so this is why it's really, really important to conserve the night sky and make sure that light's not going towards areas uh, that don't need to be lit because this trespass of blue light specifically is going to be disrupting the entire activity patterns of most living organisms, including humans. And there's a lot of research showing that blue light at night disrupts humans with serious uh, consequences and implications. And so that area that I'm talking about, so the tissue, like I just said, going up from the cells, so the tissues would be the retina, uh, where you have rods and cones. And then this other really important thing is called the suprachiasmatic nuclei or the SCN. And this is really the clock of your entire system, your entire body. This is the clock. This is the main clock that drives all the other clocks and all the other activity in your body. And it actually, to be annoying, you can just say it's, 
So it's right above, like if you were to stick your tongue in the back as far as you can and go up a little bit, that's where your clock is. And again, that's connected to the photoreceptors that have um, melanopsin in them and they're detecting whether it's day or night. The way they do that, and I cannot stress this enough, is whether there's blue light available or not. All right, so from the tissue level, then we go up to uh, the organs, which again, eyes and the pineal glands. The pineal gland is what is directly responsible for secreting melatonin, which gives you uh, those wonderful restful nights. All right, so then going from the organs up to organ systems and to, to the organism themselves, when you start disrupting the circadian rhythm through melanopsin, you have, again, that's the main clock, right, is the suprachiasmatic nuclei near the uh, pineal gland. And once you disrupt that at night, you are not just disrupting one organ system, but you're disrupting pretty much every single nervous system. So your endocrine system, your digestive system, your immune system, your nervous system. Uh, reproductive systems, all of these things are being affected. And most of them are being affected only really on a 24 hour cycle, but some other ones like the reproductive system can actually be affected over an entire year. Uh, it can be shifted, especially in the case of birds. We know that under blue light at night, a lot of birds will actually start trying to reproduce sooner in the season, uh, along with also they'll start singing earlier in the season, earlier in the day. So it just disrupts all the activity because we're with blue light we're tricking the the cells and the organs to think that it's still daylight and obviously that that is a problem um, all right so at this point we have emergent symptoms of exposure to light pollution really i focused on blue light i can talk more about just light pollution in general but really the blue light uh, is kind of i guess the, the take-home message from Value in my uh, quick talks today. And again, it has nothing to do with vision, really. You know, we can talk about those glary lights, and they are ugly, right? And actually, I have a, a blue LED on right now because it's only 640, and I plan on staying up for another uh, four hours anyway. And it it's better for visual contrast. This brings me to one point uh, that I'm sure Vayu would have talked about if we'd had more time. But the reason that you know white light is so good is because it allows for all of our cones to be able to pick up all the different wavelengths in the environment. So it gives you what's called good color rendering. The way to think about that is you have good color contrast, so you can see the colors well. And a lot of times you might be annoyed actually at your amber light at night because you might not be able to make out colors. Uh, let's say you're you know maybe looking at a picture book they're not gonna be as vibrant. And that's because the blue wavelengths aren't there. So you're getting this more reddish hue on your entire picture. In the case that you need good color rendering at night, you can always use a flashlight or you can use another light source, right? Um, and that's, I just want people to know that because my dad, who's, he's almost 80, but he has just all these super blue LEDs in his house because he occasionally wants to be able to see good color at night. And it's like, Dad, you shouldn't be exposed to this all the time uh, when instead you could just, you know, use a flashlight or have a, a blue lamp that you can use when needed. And in fact, the lamp that I have right now that's shining blue light on me, I, there's five different filters on it, so I can actually go to amber when needed. Anyway, that was just a quick soapbox about if you do need the color abilities, just use a different light source that you don't always have on at night. Your body will thank you. You'll be more uh, restful. Um, and... Another really important part is you are less likely to gain weight if you don't expose yourself to blue light. Blue light, again, dictates the timing of metabolism. So our metabolism is supposed to slow down uh, during sunset. Uh, and it's supposed to increase during sunrise with, again, the exposure of blue light and then decrease during sunset. With blue light still around, your metabolism never shuts down. And again, this has to do with melatonin. It doesn't shut down. So instead, you're continuously hungry. And my dad, by the way, does wake up every night at like 12 or 1 and eats a bowl of cereal. He's also obese. And it's he's hungry because his metabolism is not shutting down. I wish he was watching this. I should have invited him so I could pick on him in person. Um, but anyway, the point is, uh, we do know that exposure to blue light and light pollution at night does lead to obesity, not just in humans, but other organisms as well. 
And then unfortunately, this, this rat in the middle here that you see with that giant mass, so that is a cancerous mass, that's a tumor mass. And as I said earlier, right, it, blue light at night does shut down the immune system and actually shuts down cancer suppression. So we know that in direct, we know from direct studies in rodents and other mammals uh, systems that exposure to light pollution does increase cancer. We have indirect correlational data with humans because you can't, I mean, for a billion reasons, you can't take people and expose them to blue light to see if they're going to get cancer. However, due to uh, night shift workers, especially nurses, we do know that their case of getting cancer is increased um, due to night work. So it's very, 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 very likely that blue light is leading to cancer in humans. Okay, so we have these emergent symptoms up to the organismal level. But again, this is not just in humans, it's not just in mammals, but it's across the board. So here's just a quick take home. And again, we'll dive into this more uh, during our training session. But yes, it affects orientation in crustaceans. It affects migration across animal kingdoms. So birds, uh, daily migration, what's called vertical deal migration. So a lot of zooplankton in the ocean and in aquatic systems will actually hide down deep in the water column where it's dark during the day. And then as it gets darker, they'll come up. And this is what's been called the greatest migration. And it is because it happens every single day and it's billions and billions of organisms that come up to the top where they feed on algae uh, under the, the safety of darkness. However, if there's light pollution or even like really bright moonlight, they won't come up. They'll just stay down. With moonlight, it's not a big deal because the moon, the cycle changes, right? And a lot of actually most of the night is under starlight conditions. Not that big of a deal. But when you constantly have light pollution, now you're suppressing the entire mid-level of the food web from actually eating. And this can lead to trophic collapse in these marine and aquatic environments. It's very much a big problem. Uh, animal communication, the phenology or the timing of plants and animals, this is all affected through uh, light pollution. Foraging abilities, predation, reproduction. It just goes on and on. And if you want more details, come to our next uh, training sessions. Okay, but I am an insect biologist. I'm an entomologist. And this is one of my, uh, probably my highest impact papers so far is this light pollution as a driver of insect declines. So I just want to quickly highlight that there are a lot of different ways that light pollution affects insects from insects being attracted to the light, uh, as you have in moths, to some fireflies actually flashing more under light pollution or not flashing at all under light pollution, depending on the species. Some insects like the weta will actually leave entire areas that have light pollution. They just leave that entire uh, ecosystem. Some predators will actually aggregate around light posts like this bat and this tungara frog will come into the light posts because they know that there's more prey. There are Vector insects, so mosquitoes that have West Nile, are actually more likely to be in areas where there's light pollution. So we know that in Florida, uh, under light polluted skies, there are more insects with West Nile than not. And it's directly due to light pollution. It has not, it's not to do with like noise pollution or other urban things. It's specifically uh, light pollution. And it likely has to do with the immunosuppression that light pollution is having on birds so they cannot fight the virus off crazy. Um, of course, herbivory is changing based on light pollution. A really fantastic story is about dung beetles. So dung beetles go, they find a big mass of dung. This is in Australia and in Africa. They find this big mass of dung and they will roll it far away from the mass, the big, the big pile of dung, uh, and they'll lay their eggs in there. The way that they know to roll straight from the dung, so they're not just doing a circle, is they actually use the Milky Way above them. They can use that as a navigation cue. Um, however, under light pollution, the Milky Way is no longer able to be seen by the beetle, and they just go in circles. It's just random all over the place. So they're no longer able to navigate. All right, why do we care about insects? Well, insects are incredibly important for pollination. In fact, 80% uh, of flowering plants depend on insect pollination. 75% of our crop species, our food species, depend on pollination. And you might say, like, well, you know, I'm a strict carnivore. I doubt anyone in this group would say that. But the thing is that animals you eat also depend on crops that are insect pollinated.
pest control, right? If we, we need to make sure that we can serve our insect species because a lot of them actually take out the bad insects um, and, and other pests like nematodes, for instance. A lot of people here really care about birds and probably other vertebrates. Most of these vertebrate animals depend on insects as food. So again, you can have this trophic collapse that would lead to just great reductions in biodiversity. In fact, that's what we're seeing, right? This has already happened. We know that aerial uh, insectivorous, insectivorous birds are greatly reducing due to the fact that there's not enough food. Uh, and then also decomposition, right? Insects are our main waste management system. They break down, uh, well, decaying matter along with feces. Um, they, and they can actually completely restore habitats by nutrient recycling. So they're super, super important and we have to make sure we're conserving them. And one easy way to do that is to reduce light pollution. All right, and lastly, you know, this is a bird group. So I wanted to highlight some <clears throat> bird migration. And these are actually two slides that I stole from Bayou. These are really fantastic slides. This here is a map. So the colors on the, the globe here is a light pollution map. And you can see that, you know, most of Eastern United States is highly polluted. You can see most of Europe is polluted, most of India and most of Eastern Asia is polluted. The lines represent bird mi migratory paths, right? So where they're going. And you can see over here, right? There are a lot of migratory paths. There are a lot of migratory paths in India. Uh, and there are a ton of migratory paths in the Eastern United States. And we can even see here, this is a fantastic simulation where you can see the mi migratory birds going up to the north, but then they're gonna come back down. Um, so yeah, something to pay attention to is that about 70% of bird species migrate, 80% of that number migrate at night. And they usually migrate along uh, water corridors, so like Mississippi River or the coast. And I just wanted to draw your attention to this area right here where a bunch of dots just came through. And so a lot of these birds are migrating at night. They also have reduction in predation if they're flying at night. Um, and this has worked for thousands of years quite well. So again, just right here, right? So they're coming up, that's in May and June, and they're gonna come down. I need to get ending on this talk though. Yeah, so right through there. And the reason I point that out is because we use, um, you know, super bright lights to advertise things, to commemorate things. And here's an example of super bright lights during 9-11 in New York. Uh, and these are all birds that have, are migrating and they've just been caught in these bright lights and they just fly in them and they get exhausted. They don't ever fly out. They're just trapped by a sensory trap and they just fly around and then they collapse uh, and they die. And over seven years, it's been estimated that 1.1 million birds were affected by these memorial lights. Luckily now the National Park Service, for, they still continue on with the lights, but they turn them off about every 20 minutes. I actually have people, biologists from Cornell, from the lab of ornithology, counting the number of birds. And once they get to a certain uh, number, they shut off the lights for 20 minutes. It allows those birds to get on their way. Uh, and then they turn the lights back on and they do another count, right? And as soon as it reaches that threshold, they shut them off. Some people see this as really positive, right? Like, oh, this is a good way to so solve the problem. I also just don't <laughs> see why we need to have super bright blue lights to um, commemorate the 9-11 memorial. I think there are other ways that might be less energy uh, irresponsible and not result in uh, disrupting the entire migratory pathways of some species. But I am glad that we now at least shut off the lights to allow these birds to get through. Um, this scales up, right? So from that, you also have ecosystems. And like I was talking about with the vertical migration in the ocean, it goes all these different organisms are interacting. So you start to change activity patterns. It has a huge cascading effect. And um, I think actually I want to end it there. I still have some more slides, but come to the other thing and we can talk about it. Um, light is imperative for life. That's why light pollution has such a huge effect because organisms depend on light, right? We depend on it for food through plants, but it's also toxic. Uh, and it allows us to have vision. Bayou's already talked a little bit about this, about the huge variation of light. Um, but all I want to do is talk about these again, right? So I think I made all those other points already clear. And I just want to re-emphasize what Bayou said about the three axes of solutions. So 
reducing where light is, right? If no one's out there, we shouldn't have light. There's just, it's, there's no point to it. Uh, it's not being used. And if you can see a light like you can here, that's bad lighting. Better lighting is low to the ground, it's shielded, and it's only putting light where you need it, which is where your feet are going, right? So you don't trip. Temporally, we can use timers and detectors. And then spectrally, right? Don't be shining a bunch of blue light into the environment. Uh, reduce it, use amber or red lights. Now I will say there are certain cases based on insect populations where in fact blue light is a better case. And that has to do with fireflies. However, you don't have to worry about it. If you live in Missouri, you don't have to worry about that. Um, but anyway, just do know that you might go to some natural areas and you'll be like, oh, I can't believe they have this lighting. And it's actually because some beetles cannot, the red light's actually really bad for them. So some parks will actually have blue light on at certain times of the day and then shut it off uh, when the beetles are no longer active. Okay, and I'm sorry that I went a little bit longer, uh, but I'm, I'm done now. I'll leave that up until we can switch something else. Okay, great. Uh, so we got a few questions. By the way, your dad is calling, Brett. He wants to ask you some questions. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. He's, he's on hold. Well, I've given him the answers plenty of time. Right. He, he never yeah, listens. Right. So we have some questions. One of the questions is about manufacturers of lights, uh, lighting. What are they doing to help, I guess, solve this problem? Do you guys have any answers? What kind of actions are they taking? Manufacturers of lights. Well, I, well, I answered the original question on the, on the Q&A itself. And I, the, the manufacturers, as I see it anyway, and this is purely, I haven't researched this, you know, I, I'm not an expert in the field, but just looking around for solutions and how to implement them. In some, my impression is the manufacturers are basically working on the principle of supply and demand in the sense that if there is a supply, if there's a demand for certain types of products, then they will manufacture it and those then will be available at Home Depot or Menards or, or whatever. Um, and so the, so the way I'm looking at it anyway is that we, and I answered this in the Q and A's, we, we wanna make people aware of the problem and say there are better products and increase the demands for those products. And the classic example of this is not quite the fixtures, which is what I think the uh, original question was about, but, but about the color of the light is that the, when, I, when I first started looking into this about five years ago, the impression I, I got from uh, the power companies was the, the cities are asking for blue white LEDs. Um, and then I went to the city and the city people were basically not terribly educated regarding the things that Brett just mentioned that for most purposes, the amber red colored lights are better for the environment. There are exceptions like Brett mentioned, but for the most part, they just weren't aware. And the blue white does give you a bigger bang for the buck. Again, as Brett mentioned, gives you a better, it's a better representation of the actual colors of you know, stuff around you. So, so in that sense, it, it, it makes sense to get blue white light, but then the, the cons, the, the bad effects of that, in my view anyway, uh, um, you know, um, are, are worse than whatever benefit you get from that uh, blue-white re rendering. Uh, and so it's, it's a question of changing the, 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 the market. We, we have to work towards changing people's habits, like I was mentioning earlier. Now, there are things you can do. For example, if you have an ordinance passed in your community saying, we are going to use uh, shielded lights. You can't have light trespass going into your neighbor's window or whatever. Uh, you can have ordinances passed. You can have laws passed in your community, in your municipality. Uh, and you can kind of get to that in that way as well. And again, that's that top down and bottom up approach. So you have to take that. The manufacturers, as far as I can tell, they, they're reacting to the market essentially. Yeah, from my understanding, talking with the executive director of IDA is that uh, a lot of the local stores like Home Depot and others, uh, they, they, they manage based on their demand. So if there's requests coming in for fixtures that are light, you know, better, that control light pollution better, they simply put them in a better position. They actually order them. If they don't get those requests, then they don't put them there. And IDA is, is actually working with some of the Home Depots and uh, the lows and whatever else to actually tag light fixtures so you at least order them online, you know, something's more IDA approved. And so it's, it is a change. It's going to take a while to get that done. So we have a question here about what problems are LED street lights that are defective and turning purple? What are they causing? What kind of problems are they causing?
So these are high pressure sodium lights? Uh, they're not, they're not no, sand. No, no. These are LED lights. I have a couple actually out on campus here and, and they, 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 they are, are, with aging, at least some of them start emitting this kind of purple oh. hue. It kind of looks spooky. It looks like, you know, those gas chamber things you have with, with, the, with the sparks yeah. coming off. It kind of looks like- spooky. It has to do with the phosphor. I think it's so. I think it's, that's wearing it's off. aging and it probably has a leak somewhere and it's corroded or something. I don't know what the science of that is, but uh, I'm afraid I do not know the answer to your question. And I actually not, not only do I not know, I do not know if anyone has actually studied it, but it's, it's a valid that's question. That's the safe, that's the safe answer right there. And I can, so that's, I don't, I think you're right. And that's probably relatively rare. But I could say, I can guess that what's happening, so with an LED, most LEDs are actually emitting blue wavelengths of light. And then to make them with more amber color, they actually cover the, the, the light with this phosphor. And then that allows for the light to actually become more long wavelength shifted or, or redder. And probably what's happening is maybe some of that phosphor is, is leaking off as it ages. And so what you're going to be getting is more blue light. Purple is the perception of both blue and red light, but not green light. And so thinking back to what I was talking about with our, our color vision, our cones, purple is from having your red light or your, your red cone simulated and your blue cone simulated, but not the middle one, not your, your green cone. So likely what's happening is that blue light is escaping that LED that shouldn't be because it should be still covered in that that phosphor. So it's likely that just more blue light is, is going out in the environment. And from our two conversations, you know that that's probably going to have uh, consequences. By you, do you think that that's a working hypothesis that works? I think so. I mean, it's, it, it, you're right. It might not be a very common problem yet because most of these LEDs in most places, at least around Missouri, are not more than 10 years old. They're around five or six years old. And the lifetime for these LEDs as advertised is around 10 years, if I understand correctly, which tells me given how these things work, we are talking about six to seven years maybe, uh, because you know it's, it's one thing to test in lab conditions and then you have birds sitting on it and you know, hail falling on it and that sort of thing. So, so we might see more of this in the future. And, and then it's a, it's a question of uh, you know, then figuring out how that affects things like the like the question originally asked, but I don't think we have an answer yet. So Bridget had a question on Kansas City. Actually, we've been tracking that pretty closely. There's one of our associates in Kansas City that has done quite a bit of research. Uh, it's probably better, be, best to answer offline, Bridget, if you want to drop your email address into the system. We have uh, this, this Dan Gre uh, Gregory has done a lot of work with other cities to find out what they have really done and how they've tested. And I know there's a there's a pilot test going on in Kansas City right now. And yeah, I think if we can get the proper uh, audience with KCMO, we'd love to do that. Uh, we've been trying different ways to actually to make some changes. And there was a pretty nice editorial opinion, Ed, that was put into the Kansas City Star recently that uh, we can share that, so. Yeah, I also did an interview with the local, one of the local NPR. KCUR, I think it was, KCUR. Yeah, KCUR. Mm -hmm. And I just today I got another email from someone in some, some newspaper in Kansas City, okay. or newsletter in Kansas City, and they want to talk about right. it as well. So, so we are trying to, you know, trying to get the attention. And we, I think we, it's fair to say we have their attention. It's a question of how much they can do given all other constraints. And that's another thing I like to mention is this bigger city, sometimes it's harder to bring about this change because you know it's it's like the titanic you see the iceberg everyone knows something needs to be done but but you know it's it's a it's a bigger ship to to move around and the smaller towns and and cities it might actually be a little easier to get things done because you you know the mayor you know the city manager at a more personal level um, and so 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 these so Kansas City St. Louis Chicago these are actually going to be much harder to fix than say you know Marshall or 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 Kirksville or, or, or something like that. So there's a question here about education materials. Are there education materials that can be distributed and shared with people to explain light pollution? Yeah, I would, I would direct you to the IDA website. Uh, I would also, if you have specific questions, there are, 
so like IDA Missouri has lots of resources that go beyond what IDA, the, the main IDA in Arizona provides. And then there's the Texas IDA website, which has excellent resources, the Colorado Plateau, Dark Skies uh, community or whatever they call it has excellent resources. So if you have a specific type like educational resources for high school students or, or for college students or for naturalists or for general public, um, if you could clarify that, then I could give you a more specific um, place to go look for it. Otherwise, I can, you know, we can put the, these links on on the on the main web page that that Don highlighted earlier, uh, or send it via email. We can send it to Dana, and she can send it via email to you guys. So uh, Dana, how? Resource, just to finish the thought, resources is not a problem in general anymore because everyone has access, or most people have access to the internet. And the answer is somewhere on the internet. The question is, do you pose the right question and then stumble across the correct resource? Yeah. And, and I can, we can certainly help you with that once we have a, a, a more uh, specific question. Otherwise, all these resources we can. We yeah, can there, are, there are quite a bit of materials that IDA has as far as brochures. And even IDA Missouri has several brochures. So a lot of times it's a brochure that helps. Dana, how are we doing on time? I want to make sure that we don't stretch our time too much. We do have a couple of questions more, but uh, you tell us if we need to. Uh, shut down here. Well, I think that um, in order to respect our presenters' time as well as everyone else's, we still have quite a few people on here. So if there's maybe a couple more questions that we could take, that'd be great. And then we can send out a lot of um, different information via the follow-up email. Okay, great. So one of the questions is, is are, there, are there any good studies in Missouri of communities that adopted changes and how it's reversed or changed the diversity of wildlife? I don't know that. Do you know I, I think I think honestly, uh, we our chapter just formed a little over three years ago. Uh, we just simply don't have enough research yet. We're we're in the in fact, Bayou is doing a great job of measuring the change in light pollution and other kinds of things. Um, and even even um, U.S. based, um, there there's a, a fair amount of research, but sometimes it's hard to isolate. You know what happened? Maybe it's more than light that changes. Other things that cause the factors. Uh, but there are some studies out there, particularly in Europe, I think some other places that you can look at this, but it's, it's hard sometimes to really pin down exactly, you know, for the state of Missouri, what's happened if you turn off lights or whatever else. Um, I don't know if, if there's anything else we really can say right now about that, except it's in process, I guess, right? <laughs> yeah, it's, it's too early to say, and, I, and, and I'm a little uncomfortable when I, when I actually say this, but I think we have to face reality. I think we haven't hit rock bottom yet in terms of this light pollution problem. I think the, the situation will get much worse before it, it gets better. Or that's what we're trying for, is that it eventually starts getting better because people, LED lights are getting cheaper and cheaper by the day. You know, an LED bulb up at 15 watt LED bulb five years ago would have cost you double digits. It would have been 15, 20 bucks. Now it costs like four bucks. Uh, and so, uh, and it gives you that bigger bang for the buck, right? You get 15 watt LED bulb, it gives you like a hundred watt regular bulb light gives you in terms of lumens. And so people are gonna go a little crazy with their lighting. They already are, but even more crazy because it's cheaper now to burn electricity, uh, or at least it's cheaper to get the same amount of light than it was five years ago. Um, and so, so to see this reversal will accordingly be delayed because even if I fix the light here, somewhere else, more light is coming on and that process will continue for a while till we reach that critical mass where the, yeah. the, the paradigm shifts. Yeah, the light changes are, are increasing pretty, it's, there's a lot of brightness going on in our state. You can see that just, you know, over a couple of years, even around here in St. Louis, I can see how much it's, it's increased in brightness and it's a real concern for our state. So, okay, so it looks like we have two more questions. What about the 24 hour cycle of store parking lots? I never understood that. The car dealerships and parking lots being lit up all night, yeah. I never understood. And we've had the same question, in fact, in Lights Out Heartland, we've said, well, why would you have your building lights on all night? What's the point of that? I mean, there's nobody inside. Maybe the cleaning crew comes in occasionally. What's the point? And so what you're doing is you're lighting up a building to have a bird, you know, unfortunately run into it, which is, is terrible. Um, I mean, the short answer is it's cheap to do it. It's not, it doesn't, it doesn't bite them as much to do it. And that's why they do it, I suppose. Uh, and the other is a quick aspect to this is, and this was brought up in this excellent uh, like an hour long documentary on light pollution. 
uh, where they talk to, uh, you know, why don't you turn off the lights at night? And they, they, they didn't really have an answer because, you know, it's, it's one of those things you don't think about. They, that's how the previous guy used to do it. I took over this job five years ago and they were doing it that way. So I just leave it on anyway. And they mentioned that if you actually put motion sensors on your lights in high rise buildings and the cops at the crossroad over there, keeping an eye on things and all the lights in the building are off. And then suddenly a light turns on, on, on floor number 17, <laughs> right. that draws the cops attention more and says, Hey, why is this light on, on that floor over there? There shouldn't be anyone there at three o'clock in the morning. What's going on? So, and same with sidewalks, right? At the university, that's what I tell my university people is that if all the lights are dimmed and then you have a motion sensor that raises the intensity of light if someone happens to walk and the cop can't see that if all the lights are on because of the glare but if the lights are dimmed and suddenly some of the lights go on the cop knows hey there's someone walking over there and so they can pay more attention to it so so there are all these other kind of factors to this sort of thing is that why do you turn off the lights oh we don't care it doesn't cost us much but hey but if you did turn them off and put them on motion sensor and did turn on it will actually make the environment safer I think the decision makers may go home and they don't really re even realize the lights or even think about the fact that lights are on. Exactly. Okay, so one more question. And I know we have a few more questions. What I would encourage you to do is sign up for our dark sky training. We have four hours that you can really dive into the stuff and I'm sure it'll go much deeper. And by the way, uh, Brett's loves to talk about spiders. So that would be a great chance to ask good questions about spiders. So the question is, how do you, uh, the last question, how do you know if it is blue light spectrum? I would say that the first thing to look for is the color temperature and try and get as close to 2000 Kelvin as possible. But like I showed on my slide, that's not the be all end all of all because you could still have an orange looking light with a lot of blue light in it. So you need to look at the spectrum. Uh, so one way to do that is if you're buying it on Amazon or if you're buying it online, you should be able to find uh, the company that made it and just Google them up and, and see if you're really into it, then you email them because they'll have an email or contact address and say, I want to look at the spectrum, not just the color temperature, especially if you're doing like a bulk order, you know, for your park or, or your neighborhood or whatever, but even for your porch light. And then the way I do it actually is if the, on Amazon or wherever I go look for these lights, if they actually give me the spectrum, to me, that says that these people already know that these are things to be worried about. So I like these guys already because they're taking that extra step of giving the spectrum and not just the bare minimum that's required on their part to, uh, to order it. So I actually then just buy their product, even if it might be 50 cents or a dollar more expensive saying these people are more responsible and I, I want to reward them for that. Uh, there are devices that measure it or you can even call your local power company and give them Every light bulb has some sort of a code number with it, RX, four, five, seven, eight, whatever. And you can call your power company and they, I'm sure they'll follow up and tell you the specs on that light. Or if, it's, or, or if you're doing it in person at Home Depot or Menards or Costco or whatever, you can just tell them to find that out for you. It'll take longer and it'll take some effort on your part, but if you really do care. Like I said, at the bare minimum, go below 3000 Kelvin. An extra step, go closer to 2000 Kelvin. And an even extra step is then to try and find the spectrum. So Dana, thanks for- If you're, sorry, if you, really quick, oh. if, if they're asking about like a light that's already out in the environment, perhaps their neighbor's light, yeah. the general rule for whether there's blue light or not is mm -hmm. if, if it looks white or if it looks blue, there's blue light. Uh, if it looks orange, then it's probably a decent light. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, if it looks white, then there's blue light there. There's a lot of blue, yeah. I will also quickly add to what Don just said a minute ago about coming to the um, wor a workshop and then asking questions or learning more about this is, you know, e each one of you uh, from a purely um, uh, kind of practical and selfish point of view, each one of you is an asset for us. And if you come and participate in, in, in these events that we are trying to host and increase the environment, you add your knowledge and your expertise and your experience to it, that is awesome. That, that is something we want to happen. So it's not just that you will learn uh, by attending our workshop or something. Sure, some of that will happen, but the reverse process will happen as well. And we really uh, appreciate and, and love that aspect. of it. And by what you learned and you're able to talk with your local community and you'll carry much more weight than we will coming in from an, you know, like an outside city or something like that, uh, you'll be able to make a much more convincing argument. 
So Dana, thanks for your time tonight, for inviting us. And uh, guys, you both did always enjoy. I've seen you guys present multiple times and I just love every time. I just I could just sit here and watch it all day, eat popcorn and make good notes and all that all night. So I really appreciate that. Yes, Vayu and Brett, I'm really sorry that I stalked you guys for two months, but it <laughs> Based on the audience reaction tonight, it was worth it. So see you in the training because I'm taking it as well. Don, thank you. It's wonderful to work with you as always. As always. Thanks. Thanks, Dana. Thank you, everyone.